Now, Alhamdulillah, Salatu wa Salam ala Rasulullah amma ba'd. Salaamu alaykum to all of y'all greetings. Uh, this is one of your hosts of the Fudger Club, Nafis Abu Zaid, here with my other co-hosts. They can introduce themselves. Akil Ingram here. I'm Brother Abdul Haq Baker here. Now, and we're glad uh, to, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to let Brother Abdul, um, Dr. Abdul Haq go into some of the framework or the outlines to set the tone of this particular show. The title of this show is The Effects of uh, Abstract Knowledge Upon the Muslim Communities. He's going to elaborate on that and what we mean by abstract and in that community. Hopefully, inshallah, you'll get the picture. Well, I'm going to pass the mic over there to you, um, Abdul Haq. Jazakallah khair, Brother Nafis. Now, what, what I mean by um, abstract knowledge, when I was doing my PhD um, and I was, was researching, I wanted to look at why we found our communities, when we embraced the deen, many of us as converts, or those of us who were coming back into practicing um, the deen, were practicing in a way where we were using the knowledge theoretically and applying it out of context there was no contextualization there was there was the lack of knowledge on how to actualize the practice of what we were doing so our knowledge was abstract and and many will um, be able to um, identify with what i'm saying here and how it resonates so with abstract knowledge there are stages of development that we go through as individuals and as communities and this is not something difficult to comprehend those of us who've looked at um, management, um, uh, education in management and schools, we know there are life cycles, there are, <clears throat> excuse me, there are stages that they go to. So I took some of those frameworks and adapted them and developed my own. And I'm just going to go through those four to explain why and where abstract knowledge starts from. So what actually happens, for example, the first stage is the founding stage where we convert to Islam or where a Muslim returns to the practice of Islam after having a jahiliya and, and doing whatever he or she was doing out there. And that particular stage is a very idealistic stage. Okay, there's no knowledge there. We're in love with Islam. We're in love with everything that is given to us. And we want to practice like we were in the time of the Sahaba. The next stage is the youthful phase, which is the idealistic, what some of us will call the hype stage, where we want to go out and preach to the world. But still, we haven't got that knowledge. We're taking snippets of information from here. We're taking snippets from information from there, maybe on YouTube, maybe from lectures we're hearing from scholars. And we're applying it carte blanche without any understanding or contextualization of it. Now, these two stages, the founding stage, the youthful stage, these are where the abstract knowledge are implemented. And what we do, we end up alienating others sometimes. We end up burning out ourselves sometimes because we've taken everything on board, thinking that we can practice it in the context of the time of the Prophet ﷺ, or as though we are living in a predominantly Muslim society, Arab, or Muslim land where the context is totally different and what ends up happening we more often than not live a disfigured existence within the communities that we're in we've alienated the wider non-muslim community those of us who have embraced and um, in Salafia we, in, we alienate ourselves from the wider Muslim populace as well and we do that quoting ayats of Quran and hadith out of context often, miscontextualized, believing that this is the haq and this is how the haq should be purveyed. So our knowledge is abstract. And that's until we move. And I'm going to stop at this point, um, Nafis, after this, I've given the rest of this theor theoretical framework. When we progress to the latter two stages of that four stage model that I developed, the third stage being the adult stage, that's a more maturation stage. That's a stage where we have matured on the dean. We're understanding the context of what we're learning a bit better. We're reflecting on our earlier two stages and that idealistic abstract, abstract application of knowledge. 
that's when we start understanding the foundations, including Tawheed, and how it can be actualized. That adult phase and the final stage of wisdom, where not only have we um, readjusted aspects of our understanding, we've reinforced them are, and, and are now able to share them and engage and participate in society with a balanced perspective of the deen and the sunnah. These latter two stages, adult and wisdom, the stage of wisdom, they are the stages of actualization. We need to move as individuals and we need to move as communities towards that adult and mature stage because we've seen for the past 20 years the damage that's been done where we're acting on knowledge in a miscontextualized um, setting and the harm that is done to ourselves and to communities. Brother Akil, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, to, to, to add on to what you're saying, I would like to uh, make a point and then echo uh, something that you mentioned, Dr. Baker. And, and the first thing that you mentioned concerning the, the abstract phase and then the youthful phase, um, I would I would say that in the beginning that can almost be sufficient for many, um, but now at this point, many of us we can think back thirty years ago because we were around in the nineties, and we're at the stage that you're talking about now. This more this more adult phase. So um, in context, what this appears to be uh, to me, and I would like to hear all of your thoughts is what we are in need of in contextualizing is integrating into societies that we live in without compromising the tenets of our faith and mm. being able to balance uh, being able to balance those two now a, a challenge with this that i will also offer is that um well as i was just stating everybody's not going to have 30 plus years in so with people constantly embracing the faith at exponential rates we're always going to have more people coming in at these at these entry level phases, right? The abstract phase and the youthful phase. And it may take an individual 20 plus years, as you stated, to get into an adult phase. Um, and in my humble estimation and my experience, a, a new Muslim is a new Muslim for at least five to seven years. Mm. And, and it may take about 20 years or so to to get some of our past life and habits and even ideologies at times out of our system entirely and and, and it's interesting that you actually said that um brother akil because honestly uh we've been harping on that a lot in terms of the ayat where allah Jalla Allah makes it clear about the stages the beginning stages of when coming into islam for any of us yeah you like in amanu udukulu fi silmi kafa this verse where allah Jalla Allah highlights this in surah baqarah he says that, oh, you who believe into Islam wholeheartedly. So I think that what Brother Akil, what you're saying is it's going to take a lot to remove the uh, all of those remnants of disbelief, those remnants of those false concepts or ideologies that they've been used, used to practice before even coming into Islam. And I think that that stage was actually, um, uh, that stage was actually actualized through the Prophet Sallam period of he connecting to their hearts, cleansing them of those, making that taught to be a cleansing them of those things that they had as far as the ideologies, as far as the concepts that was foreign, that went against what Islam actually, you know, was promoting and so forth. So I think you're right. It's, it's going to take time for the new beginner, you know, the Shahada, the new Shahada, probably the Shahada, like he says, five, seven years, probably even longer to remove a lot of that stuff that, that they came in with. I think what both of you said is, is, is excellent. Um, and it's encapsulated within the studies and with the, the lived experience that we're speaking about. So for example, you're absolutely right that those at the entry level, it's going to take some time. But what's so key about what we're discussing now? I don't know about you two, but when I came to the Dean, we didn't have elders telling us, advising that we're going to undergo this particular process. Absolutely. And so in that taking place, we came on board, we're on the Sunnah, we're on Salafia, they were not, and the ostracization started of everyone else because we'd come to the deen, which is the haq, and not only were we on the deen, but we were following the Sunnah according to the correct, correct um, way, and nobody else was. So in us discussing this now, 
and being able to share with those coming in at the entry level, as uh, Akil has, has, has articulated so nicely, um, that foundational stage, to make them understand where they are. And this is not just only within the community level. We've seen individuals come in at this stage, the foundation stage, the adult phase, and they've become frustrated with communities. And some have gone off to extremism, be it violent extremism and terrorism. Others have gone to an extreme liberalism, as we say in, vert in inverted commas, progressive Islam, where they've got a diluted liberal version of Islam because they could not understand the requirements of orthodoxy. And, and, and Brother Nafis, as you've highlighted the, the, the um, ayat from Allah, and we also know the hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that this religion is strong. We should enter the religion and not go to extremes. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, don't go to extremes. This religion is bigger than us. It would overwhelm us in that instance. So if we are speaking about these stages of cognitive development with a view to the new um, Muslim, the revert, understanding this, the community, the new Muslim community, understanding we will go through these stages and some of us are going to be at different levels of cognizance. So for example, you can have someone who's well experienced in life. He may be in his 40s and his 50s. He's a professional, he's achieved everything dunya-wise, but he's still at that founding stage with regards to ideology, with regards to understanding and implementing the deed. So it's not an age-restricted um, uh, framework per se, but we need to be able to identify the stages that everyone is at so that there's a respect. One of the things that happened outside of Islam, from, from the black communities I came from, maybe the same with yourselves in America, there's not a respect for leadership and authority. When we were younger, we respected our elders. You both will that resonate with you, even if our elder was a year older than us. We respect them, even if we'd surpass him or her in knowledge, we respected them by virtue of their age and who they were as a community, as communities, as people of Sunnah. We need to understand these stages so that we can implement them and start affording the respect and acknowledgement of our elders and their position. And we, with our youngers and their newness, or rudimentary stages they may be at. And then I'll conclude on this point of, the, at this, of this stage. When we identify these, we can do, which my organization, which I, I use the framework in the organization that I, I was working with youth in. We, when you've got someone coming in in those first two stages, they should be upon a curriculum of learning, social, economic, social, cultural, social, religious. In what way? They come into Islam, and that foundation stage where the abstract learning is taking place, they should be learning Tawheed and how to actualize Tawheed at that stage. What does it mean, knowing that Allah is Al Rahman? What does it mean that he's Al Ghafur? What does it mean in your daily life and as a community? They also need to know about the Sirah and that Sirah being contextualized with the society and environment they're living in. Unlike what we see from other rudimentary stages, and I'll stop here, where the, the tuck theories, the liberal individuals, for example, the liberal extremists, as I call them, they politicize. They politicize and teach a politicized understanding at that stage, call into emotions and rhetoric. Look at what's happening to the Muslims today. The rest of the Muslims are weak. We need soldiers. We need this politicized understanding being taught at these rudimentary stage is toxic and dangerous. So that's why we need to make sure Okay, you are coming in at this stage. This is what you're going to be going through. This is what you need to be focusing on. This is how it will help you tactically as well as spiritually and emotionally in our lives. Because we become Muslims, we jump in, we're married, kids, everything, divorce rates, everything like this. Because everything we're doing is abstract. The Prophet Sallallahu said like this. Okay, we understood it. The Sahaba married many times. So it's okay for us to marry many times. Have we understood it? Or are we, as Akil, as you've highlighted, holding on to baggage from Jahiliya and bed hopping like we used to do back in the day, but garnishing it with religious terminology? Yes. Well, well, I, I believe, well go ahead, go ahead, Nafis. Yeah, no, I, I honestly believe that it's inedible that people come in and hold on to baggage. 
suggested that you, you, you can't really escape that because if you go back again to the earlier days of Islam, you're going to see that's what Allah Jalla wa Ala in his hikmah as the hadith of Aisha and anha and Akil can probably remind us of it, where she mentioned that Allah, have Allah started with the don'ts before starting with the, you know, uh, don't for the do's, you know, there were people would have broke away from it. And it took them a while. So you look at the ayah that dealt with Kamr, it was in three different places in three different times, you know, in three different yeah. sores where Allah Jalla wa Ala is talking about before he finally said it was this. So it was a lot of that baggage still had to be, you know, the effects of it had to take them from one stage to another. But I wanted to highlight if I kill, I kill you got something to say, and then I will highlight something that you said earlier in your talk, uh, Dr. Duhoff. Sure, sure, appreciate you. Um, mm -hmm. Two points to, to, to mention here, um, of course, back in what Dr. Baker has mentioned. And the first one is your point that you, that you mentioned about respecting our elders, even if the person is a year older than us. This is something that, that highlights culture. And we, we have a principle, and it is that culture can be a judge. And this is one of the five universal laws we have in, in Sharia, one of the universal principles we have, we find it in legal theory. So we also understand from this particular principle that whenever we have broad commandments within our law, that are not necessarily specified or restricted, then the guidelines for that become culture. Mm -hmm. And in this abstract phase that you're that we're speaking to, we often and, and I speak to um, I speak to Western Muslims that are embracing the faith. We we often have a mindset that Islam itself is our culture, and then we detach from the culture that we were raised in, and that creates a void we begin mm -hmm. importing the cultures of others that we are learning from, um, often from, from Arabian or, or Indo-Pak societies. We then import those cultures and in those particular slots, and they don't always apply to our world real time. No, the, no. The, 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 the I, second I, point, I agree with that 100%. Go ahead. We have to make a distinction between um, culture and between Islam. I think that's 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 really important. Yeah, correct. I want to see something earlier what you were talking about abstract and as far as practicality. I, I just want to remind people that Allah Jalla wa Ala, when he sent the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he made certain things clear. So Allah Jalla wa Ala, he says, Laqad ja'akum rasulun min anfusikum. All right. This is important for me and important, you know, for everyone to understand that Allah Jalla wa Ala sent a messenger from amongst ourselves. Meaning when he sent the messenger from amongst yourself, that was an, a sign to them that this particular messenger was relatable. Do you understand? So Absolutely. He's relatable. He's not foreign. He's not something that's new. He's he understands your culture. He understands your language. He understands so forth. Henceforth, Allah Jalla wa Ala says, "Wa ma arsalna min rasulin illa bi lisani qawmihi liyubayyin lahum." Al ayat. Allah Jalla wa Ala says, "We have not sent any messenger, you know, any messenger except with the tongue or to speak the language of his people, in order to clarify to them this concept of being relatable. It's practicality." I'm, I'm trying to let you see that. Allah Jalla wa'ala Jal also says in Surah Yunus, that the Prophet says to his people, right? Uh, indeed, I have spent a lifetime amongst you. You understand? So you know me. I Do you not have any sense? So this concept of practicality is that the fact that Allah Jalla wa'ala sent us people who can relate to us, who live our cultures, who live our lives, who actually you know friends so that i think we need to look at that more so than being abstract and then the second thing i want to I like, the second thing i want to say is after we realize how relatable the, the, the messengers are such as muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam right then the second thing is just to touch on is the eternal journey that people have do hafiki you was mentioning earlier how do we get them to um to learn and do those do those um beginning stages Okay, the abstract stage. How do we get them to begin to learn, right? It's eternalized first. Islam is eternalized before outwardly. And that's right. what, that's if you look at the period of Tawheed, it was affecting what first? The color. It wasn't affecting just the body first. He didn't come with rules and regulations of doing this or doing that. He came yeah. with things that deal with connecting to Allah, connecting who he is. And that's what you were saying, teaching him about who is all about Islam, teaching about Sarah, you know, so forth. But that internal stage has to happen 
if anyone wants to shape their world better, no matter what culture they're in, it also depends upon their eternal stage with the religion that they, you know, with Islam. They're going to have to do that. And I don't think that we can put people all on the same level in regards to that. Because it goes and I want to, if, if I may, because and the feast is spot on. I think we're all um, on, on the same wavelength in this. And uh, Brother Akil, I know you've got a second point to come. And I'm going to speak to that, to, to open the floor for you on that. And that's why when we're looking at the aspect of culture that brother akil highlighted so importantly and what you've just said nafis with regards to the um, messengers coming to their people okay the prophet sallam is the only messenger and rasul who came to mankind and jinn the only one okay so he he spoke to all of us and when we look at that we see around him and in his family there were many black sahaba there were many black people black was a norm and we've got to understand that the society and the, the time that the era that we're living in, this era of civilization, is a is a predominantly white imperialist civilized imperialist civilization. Prior to that, blackness was predominant. It was prevalent. There was no issue. You look at the Roman Empire and go before that. Why am I saying this now? I'm coming to the point that I want to highlight. Many of us, and this is not just for African Americans. African Caribbean. This is for all the Muslims who want to engage in this. But what we've seen is that when blackness is referenced by us as Muslims, not from a pan-African perspective or a pro-African, a pro-black perspective to the deference of or uh, to the marginalization of all other cultures, we are silenced. We are chastised for speaking to causes that are that affect us. And I'm going to bring one example, the George Floyd incident. Yes, he was a non-Muslim, but the issue of anti-black racism that is within the Muslim communities and the wider society, it's not peculiar just to non-Muslim, non, um, non-Muslim um, African-American. So when we're speaking about an issue that affects us, we are speaking to that issue of oppression against the type of people. What's happening, and we need to really redress this imbalance, we are quick as a people to jump onto every other cause, Palestine, Uyghurs, um, you name it, Kashmir, all of this we're ready to jump upon, and rightly so. But when it comes to black issues where the detractors will come from among ourselves, first and foremost, and say, no, this is not from the Sunnah, this is wrong, this is, you, you are um, talking about something that is away from Islam. And that voice and that narrative is coming from, and I'll be, I'll be challenging in this, from Arabized understandings of black Muslims and other Muslims who have that Arabized understanding or that Asian-fied understanding. This is problematic and comes back to what Akil was saying with regards to culture. We are not to shed that culture or aspects of our culture that are conducive to Islam. Allah says in Surah Hudra, Ayat 13, we know it. He made us into tribes and nations so that we may know one another. There's nothing in the Quran that says that you may shed your culture and become one. Under Tawheed, yes. Under the Sunnah, yes. Under culture, no. So while we're speaking today, this Fajr Club, this particular um, launch, as we've all agreed, is setting a premise for those who are going to contribute, those who are going to participate, to know the wide mosaic upon which we're going to talk. And we're going to speak about aspects of culture unashamedly, and uh, um, uh, um, without feeling that in raising a particular issue, that, oh, you're going to be accused of being a uh, black nationalist. Because we're not just going to be talking about blackness, and we're not going to be talking just about black um, excellence. We're going to be talking about community issues and the challenges that come within those as we interface with other communities, with other cultures, and are there solutions? And if not, we will find those solutions together. So I've spoken about uh, Brother Defeat, the issue that you highlighted, and spoke to what you highlighted, Brother um, Aki, because they are so important to emphasize at the outset of this collaboration, inshallah. I hope you agree. Definitely agree, we definitely agree with that. And um, what I would like to, to add to further the discussion is when we when we talk about the abstract um when we're speaking in the abstract i should say uh 
then we, we often we think in terms that are binary. Yes, no, right, wrong, good, bad. When, when we become more mature and develop, we realize in many issues, there's actually a spectrum of color. There's a range. There is more so towards good and more so towards bad and understanding that there is there or there are foundational matters that there is no given them. But many other matters, there, there's a bit of a spread. So with this and looking to add some solution to it, I, I do think that a large part of the solution is education, as you both are saying, and making that education uh, practical. Now, in our rearing, we, we have a curriculum that we're all aware of that we have come up under uh, throughout throughout our different scholarship that we learn from and our teachers. And we, we know those particular books. Now, when we are educating uh, our people with regards to these particular works, either we have to begin to take these same works and make them practical to what we have in front of us real time, as opposed to only highlighting the challenges of the Muslim world let's say 700 years ago or a thousand years ago. We can still do that from a historical standpoint, but we have to bring a current to the challenges that we're currently facing. Either that, or we have to take the knowledge that we have in the works that we have and establish uh, a new curriculum that works for the people that are in front of us and the challenges that we have real time. Honestly, um, just to add to what uh, Brother Akil was saying, I remember Dr. Tar here, he was making a good point about the difference of teaching the earlier books of Akita and the way that those books were actually taught to make it solidify amongst the principles or the tenets of faith for the believers, okay? And then teaching books of refutation, refuting people of innovation and so forth. They weren't taught, they weren't taught to the early, to, to, to the beginner stage Muslims uh, for that simple purpose. What we have found in the history of, uh, of you know, the different communities is that we've been, we would teach books that normally was for Rudud, for refutation, uh, before really honing on honing in on books that were actually books that was building our faith. Right. right? So it, it caused that what you're talking about, either we have to have something where we make it practical from those things and not from you know thousands of years or seven hundred years back, we make it more practical. But I think honestly again, I think honestly again, it it, it really it really depends upon the person who's actually teaching, you understand, understanding his people. And it's important that you understand the people that you're teaching to. And it's important that, you know, you relate to them as much as possible. And that's what I was trying to um, highlight earlier about why Allah Jalla wa'ala mentioned these verses about the prophets being so relatable and not being angels. And not being, because remember the Quraysh, they was actually saying that. How come an angel is not sent with him? Mm. And Allah makes it clear, has the angel walking amongst you, then you would have been confused anyway. But it's important why Allah kept mentioning him sending someone that they can relate to. And I know it might don't seem that there's a connection here, what you guys are saying. It is a connection. And the way that I see the connection is that the person who's teaching and directing to the audience in front of them, he has to take in consideration their culture, their background, their understanding. He has to. He can't just say, okay, I'm going to give you some abstract um philosophies or some ideologies or some concepts and say, okay, this is going to apply to you. That's not how it works. You understand? It doesn't work that way because then now you create a barrier between the actual people that's learning, all right, and the information that they are, they're actually, you can create a barrier from it. I don't know. I'm, I'm, and, and, and what you said, no, Nafis, Jazakallah khair, again, building upon what you and Akhil have said, this is so important because what we've actually seen is we've seen gatekeepers come among our community who are unqualified gatekeepers where they put themselves in particular positions that they're gatekeepers to scholars and as gatekeepers to those scholars the information that is transferred backwards and forwards is out of context and we've seen that those communities now become dependent on those gatekeepers become fearful of those gatekeepers because what actually comes to an extent i call it what it is it's an element of shake worship OK, and you don't hear the, the fundamentals of the deen being the focal point and that guide anymore. It becomes that sheikh. And this is something that I think ravaged the um, Salafi community late 90s. Up until that point, the learning of Tawheed, the learning of the Sunnah, learning about Jahwa Tahdil as it related to Hadith 
I've still got my notes. Um, the Chronicles of UK Salafism. I, I read through the notes and everything that's there, which clearly shows that's where it was. But this is where we come back to recognition of elders and leadership now, because it wasn't our elders who had studied properly who started bringing that refutation culture in, brother Nafis, brother Akil. I think you'll agree with me on that. It came from amongst lay people who were seeking con con controversy, position, closeness to scholars, reputation, and then that's what happened. And what we saw was a bastardization of aspects of the deen. The deen isn't bastardized, but these individuals bastardized particular concepts and learning to where we saw this refutation culture being the primary um, pillar upon which Salafis became known. And let's be clear, this, this, we as Salafis are the most despised amongst the communities at the moment because of division and refutation culture and the like. We as Salafis, and I'm not saying on the whole, it speaks to some of us, but on the whole are seen as haughty, dismissive and, um, and, and arrogant, okay? The, none of the, the qualities and essence of raka'iq um, and also good manners and all of these things are seen amongst us as a collective. And this emanated from the late 90s to where we are now. So I think what you're saying, um, Nafis, regarding the learning, it comes back to acknowledgement, recognition of learning and seniority from within our own communities. MashaAllah, Tabrakala, you've got some um, qualified students of knowledge in America who study, they've put in the work in the US. We've got a few in the UK as well, but their positions are not where they should be. We do not recognize them like we should. But however, if you had now an Arab, a non-black, come from the, 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 the Arab Muslim universities with a quarter of the studying of some of the brothers that are among yourselves, Suddenly that individual is a sheikh. Suddenly that individual is um, a, a, a scholar spoke of him. But there's no recognition of the brothers and some of our elders, like Sheikh Abdul Raouf, for example, who have put in the work over decades. So I, I'm highlighting this point here. Again, why? We need to redress the imbalance. We need to be promoting, supporting, and going to, accessing those qualified individuals amongst us who have lived experiences of the transpose, I was going to say transposing or the transformation, sorry, of communities from that founding stage as it moved up to the, the, the youthful, adult, mature phase and where things broke down and where they went wrong. So we can look at where those errors were made and we can repair and address them so that we don't have to keep doing a, a, a rinse and repeat. Get into a particular stage, then the community collapses and another one formed, and the cycle repeats itself. Do you like, um, do you like uh, to interject here, uh, Akil? Sure, and um, yeah, I agree with you spot on. And um, if, if we're being frank, the, the exact thing that you have described, we've experienced that here in America, exactly what you've described. Um, but what I, would, what I would say to, to kind of add to that is as we, as we develop in our faith, and the propagation of our faith, this presentation, and 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 such, we have to learn to make the distinction between personalities, <clears throat> between a group, and between a methodology. No. Uh, I, I think often we conflate the three. No, right? we we conflate no. personalities in groups for a way of life and a methodology, no. and and I think that gets us all gets us off track many times. Right. So so we limit um, and we may not even realize we're doing it at times. Right. We, we limit Tawheed and Sunnah. We limit orthodoxy. We limit orthopraxy to the trajectory of a given personality or the trajectory of a given group. And the, the personality or the group is not the orthodoxy or the orthopraxy of the faith itself. But Nafis, go ahead. You, you wanted to say? No, brother, Dr. Bruhak Baker has been on point beginning of the show and all the way up to now. The points that you're bringing are very um, legitimate, and it is a concern, and it has been a concern, and it will continue to be a concern. But what I want to what I want to say is that we have to remember the true essence of uh, success for any dawah, 
And the first has to be ikhlas, sincerity, right? And why is I'm speaking about this? Because it's important, again, that we understand that Allah Jalla is in control of the success of anyone's dollar, right? Mm. And for both the people who are re the recipients who are receiving the information and both the people who are dis dis you know, um, disseminating the information, they both have to be sincere. Right. And along that line, something happened. So we had people start to do like what they're doing in the hip hop world, or they start to do what they did back in, you know, the pimp days or back in the days before Islam. They came in and they figured how to monetize Islam. They figured right. out how to control Islam, place themselves in to a certain position. They started to do that because somewhere along the line, that essence was forgotten. That sincerity was actually the premise because the law tells Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam multiple times, Brother Quran, I kill you, aware of this. Brother Jahak Bikki, you aware of this. Fa'abudullah and Mukhlis Salaf Udin. Okay, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You got to make your deen sincerely for him. That concept has to keep being etched inside us. Another thing that I think a lot of the youth who are put in positions to teach have lost the, the, the understanding of is taking from the character of the Prophet. That's extremely yes. important. The character of the Prophet should be embodied in every call. And yes. what happened is when you just start taking the information, okay, and you just disseminate the information, but you're not embodying the information nor putting any importance on embodying that information, it becomes. Like the brother, brother Akil was saying, it becomes where it all get fuddled and mixed together, where people cannot distinguish between the personality, the methodology, you understand what I'm saying? And right. the individuals. So I think this needs to be understood. And I just want to mention two things real quickly, if y'all guys let me. One is the verse where Allah Jalla Allah says, Ya you nas wa bakum. O people, Allah address all of mankind, right? Fear your Lord. And he says this twice in this verse, right? I just want to make a point here. Then he mentioned how, you know, mankind is created from a single soul, etc. Another verse that you alluded to earlier in your talk, Dr. Um, Dr. Abdul Haq Baker, um, the Surah Hujarat, verse 15, where Allah Jalla says, Ya you and again, in that, all right, in and then we are, and then we created you, men, Zakar, and Wa'unta, right, from a male and female, and we made you into nations and tribes. And then Allah says, in the akramakum in the lahi atkakum. So this is the point I'm on, I want to mention here. Not right. about the reef thing. I want to mention this real quick. Notice in both verses, Allah is addressing mankind. And then he's also addressing their origin. Okay? And he's addressing them as societies and communities. Right? But notice what he's keeping at the bedrock for those communities to flourish. For those communities to, to operate correctly. It's taqwa. Yes. Okay? And this is important. Whenever you step in the realm of dawah, when you step in the realm of teaching, disseminating, taqwa has to be at the forefront. It has to be at the forefront. And that's exactly what any, any society, we have to practice taqwa. So that was just the point I wanted to bring to connect it. Hopefully it makes sense to you guys. No, that, that, made, that made a lot of sense. I think, as, as you said, the taqwa, the ikhlas, and as Brother Akil had said about these three aspects becoming conflated, and then you, the, we start judging others according to a personality. And saying that that personality is Islam, when in actuality that couldn't be further from the truth. When we look at our contemporary context, no one, a very few, are of that stature um, among ourselves. So I, I, I believe that what has to happen, and, and as we discussed prior to this show, I'm going to revisit later on what we've discussed and take down notes because I feel that there's some some gems that have been shared by yourselves that we need to keep recycling and sharing with our viewers and having the practical, pragmatic steps of implementation, whether it's individually, as you were saying, Nafis, looking internally, or and you, Akeem, saying about internalizing. We need to be looking at that because if we're not going to do that and we're going to listen academically and, um, and, and discuss things, it's always going to stay on the table and we're not going to see any transformation from an internal perspective and from a no. community perspective. And what we've got to look at, we have vibrant communities. We've got a dearth of, or sorry, should I say, a depth of wealth with regards to the talent that's there. We've got sisters who are very intellectual, who are educated, who are very firm on the deen, who have got uh, uh, hearts that are yearning to really actualize the deen as Muslims. 
as wives, as mothers. We've got brothers with the same thing, but there's an apprehension now because if they put a foot forward and they are judged to be outside of that paradigm or that straitjacket even that is their community, then they're going to be cut off and they've already stepped away from the, um, the wider uh, Muslim society to an extent to be embraced in the Muslim community. And so if they're ostracized from there, then they have nowhere to go. But I want to say here and now to everyone, each an individual, we should not fear the blame of the blamers, the criticism of the blamers. We should not fear if someone's going to go to a learned brother or to a scholar about us. Our deen, and if we're Salafis, as Salafia, is between us and Allah. I love you two for the sake of Allah, but you two do not have anything to do with my Salafia and determine my Salafia. I, I, I love you, I will take your advice and everything like this, but it, it is, you are not the Mizan whether I'm Salafi or not. And a community is not the Mizan and criteria of whether I'm a Muslim or Salafi or not. What brings us into the deen is clear. What exits us from the deen is clear. What removes us and divorces us from the sunnah, from Salafia, is clear. As is what is the adherence to Salafia. If we don't know this now, we will forever be within that source or confusion that Aquila's described, where he brought the three strands together and the, the, the epitome of them now that dictates the sunnah, the learning, is a personality. A personality. So I think that we need to really invite those who are watching this to, to shed that yoke, that chain that has been constricting them so that we can properly grow together. And we will discuss challenging things. Um, we want to bring brothers on and sisters on, as you've highlighted before, um, Nafis. And we want to talk about things that are peculiar to our community. I'll bring one that I, I was listening to a discussion um, recently where um, Sheikh Abu Sama, for example, was speaking to converts. And they were asking about this period of Christmas. And said, no, we cannot celebrate Christmas and everything. But if you've had your grand and your aunt and your family calling you for years just to come and sit and say, we know you don't celebrate. But this is the only time of the year that we get together as family. Don't eat no Christmas pudding. Don't do any Thanksgiving or whatever. Just come give us a hug, show us some love. And you're going to say, no, I'm on the sunnah and I can't see you. And we're going to... Abu Sama addressed that. And how he addressed it was beautiful. He gave it a context. Then another one of my sheikhs who comes from a different region, an Arab region of the world, sent me the link and said, what do you think of this two-minute clip? And I said, sheikh, it's on point. That sheikh fluent in English, because my Arabic's not that strong, says no, and he brought all these ayat about the Jews and the Christians, said, but Sheikh, he's not talking about that. He's talking about the family interaction that has always existed. And this is a form of dawah because many of us cause damage with our families. I was one of them. We're Muslim now. I can't come to your home. My children are not coming to see you. I'm not going to come for this whole period of time. Um, we, you can come to us on Eid. This is what we do. And they would see us behaving in a way that they didn't understand, it was alien to them. This was a negative dawah in that instance. Without compromising tenets of our deen, we could do, as Sheikh Abu Sama was saying, engage as family members with our family. And we've got the Prophet Sallallahu as an example of that. And then to conclude on this point here, why I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing this, my Sheikh and, and close colleague who's from the Ar um, Arab world, I wanted to say to him, Look at what's happening in your land. Isn't that where the focus should be at the moment? Instead of telling us how to contextualize our understanding according to uh, an understanding and context that is contemporary and three and a half thousand miles away. We are not Arab. We I do not look as Arabs. And I'll come to this point as well. Alhamdulillah, I'm wearing a thobe today. You know I'm in the UAE. Um, but I wear a thobe that is tailored according to where we are from. How we dress is from where we are from. We've got to shed the yoke of Arabization, and I'm not against Arab, Arab, Arabs at all. We've got to shed the yoke of, of, of Asian, Asianification, if I can call it that. We have to understand and identify what our culture is, and we've got to embrace it. Okay, okay, okay. I, I want to play devil's advocate, but I'm gonna let Akil go ahead first. Um, but I'm going to play double advocate with a couple of things that you said. You might 
I mean, that's, that's the thing about me. I'm going to be a little bit controversial with you here. Brother, <laughs> just forgive me. It's all friendly, but I just want you to understand. I have a different look on that. <laughs> but go ahead. I kill you. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I'll just mention, um, raise, raise one question, really. And um, I know we're getting close to wrapping up. No. And, and, and reflecting uh, what Dr. Baker is saying, what Sheikh Abu Osama um, would, be, would have been mentioning, is this question here. Is the sin of breaking the family ties greater than the sin of being present for those particular events? No, and that's, if, that's if we say that the sin of breaking the family ties is greater, then we have to uphold maintaining our family ties, uh, even over being present for for such events, even even if we are not participating in the event itself or engaging in the worship of the event, but focusing on and joining the family ties in and of itself. No, and I think I killed you was right there on point. I mean, you took it right out. That's why I was going to play devil's advocate with this. Because, you know, to me, I really realize the definitive example that you can give to your non-Muslim relatives if you stick to your principles. And sometimes they, I mean, they appreciate you more when you're wow. not, uh, when you're not so compromising. And you see yeah. that with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his character and things like that. You see that he wasn't compromising. And I think that this is an opportunity, like you said, to actually teach and educate. It would get an inquisitive mind from your family member to say, hey, why so-and-so is not around? Okay, you know, and then it would contact you. And in that moment when they contact you, you can enlighten them about the reason why your Lord hasn't sanctioned us to follow such and such. But I would love to get with you on another opportunity. Just at this particular day, I can't get with you. And the problem is a lot of us don't have to articulate ourselves, nor are we willing to do that. So we don't want to take the advantage of giving the dollar and showing an example in doing that. So that was my point with that. Like, you know, in terms of, okay, let's just get in a row. No, make a distinct a, a distinction. Because sometimes if you make the distinction, you stand with your principles, people respect you for that. And that could be a I means mean, of leading someone to doubt. Right? Nah. My other point, you go ahead. That's what we're just on that. But yeah. Before you put that point, what I love about what we're discussing here is that there's a divergence in the perspectives that are placed there. I understand but they, what you're they're coming from a place of love, and we need to be able to, not not us three, but we need to be able to epitomize the ethics of differing, knowing the, the objectives and the intentions, because we should have us done. This is has been shown in the Quran. In Surah to An'am, what the Allah Jalla says, when people are speaking ill of our ayats, what do you do? They teach you a proper way of actually excusing yourself. Right, not going to you know. I understand exactly what you're saying. So it's it's how it's the act of how you do something. You don't have to right. be belligerent. You don't have to be ignorant. You don't have to be so restrictive or not uh, uh, understanding. You understand? You don't have to do that. Right. You can do it in a nice way. But the yes. problem is, it was something else you said. I wanted to touch on, but I kind of missed it. And I know we got to wrap up. Uh, we wanted to normally go for 45 minutes. These people have obligations. Uh, the last thing I'm going to mention is that just Abdul Hak Baker, just your overall um presentation was beautiful may Allah reward you your input yeah. as well um i kill ingram was definitely beautiful may Allah reward you good points good points from both of you guys my co-hosts i just want to mention one thing there is a responsibility on both the teacher and the student on both the community member as well as the leader there is a responsibility and that responsibility is not for gold it is not wavered just because one the leader might go to the left or go too far to the right, or just because the actual community member go too far to the left or to the right. We have to understand that responsibility. And I think a lot of times that is misconstrued. Some people appeal to certain personalities because it appeals to certain things that they were used to or rare upon or cultivate upon. And then they get into that. So if a person is always talking about we hate the people of Bidah, that might appeal to some individuals. And because of their ignorance of not taking the responsibility of being sincere, first and foremost, and learning, they gravitate towards that personality. And this is what they want to hear. So like what you was talking about, the, politi the politicizing of the different groups that are extremists and how they appeal with the emotional chords. Right. So I just want us to understand that there's a responsibility shared between both the teacher, both the student, man. Because I think a lot of times these individuals who have been placed in this position have been doing this to us for communities for years 
there is not all the blame on them. No. I don't believe all the blame should be on them. I believe the blame should be shared between those who follow them because Allah has a verse in the Quran and I have to stop. Um, Jazakallah Khaim, if Alhamdulillah you have any questions, we do have a clubhouse for the Fajr Club that is set up that where we can discuss those questions uh, more at length and open and be more a little bit direct on the clubhouse and you can actually uh, sign up to the Fajr uh, Club group. Uh, we're part of, we did post the link here on the, um, uh, the Facebook page. We got to get it set up for the YouTube page as well. We thank you all for tuning in. We got to go and enjoy our day. This is your brother, Nafis Abu Zaid. This is your brother, Abdul um, Ingram. And this is your brother, Abdul Baker. Inshallah Ta'ala, we see you guys next week on the Fudger, uh, the Fudger Show and Podcast. Also, we um, we do have some interviews set up, Inshallah Ta'ala, so that will be a treat. We have some people coming in talking about their respective communities. We thank you guys for tuning in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.